All right. What did the ocean say to the beach? Nothing. It just waved. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. That's it. Hey, we two for two. We two for two. That's it. <laughs> Look here. Um, I wanted to start with a question because a lot of times I don't know where I know somebody from. Like I've known somebody so long that I've known, you know, I don't right. really know well. And in my mind, we met when you were at John Carroll. But as life as life, I've realized you were our lady of Fatima. Right. Like you was in the hood. Like so it's like you need to get me straight. Right. First, tell your story, <laughs> but in the story, get me straight. Man, and I'm it, it, and honestly, that's funny because my wife had actually asked you that. Now, when did you meet Ivan? And I was like, honestly, I can't really tell you one hundred percent because, first of all, Ivan was pie, <laughs> and that was like this urban legend. It was like. Coming up in the 70s, 80s in Birmingham, look here, you had the age where that was BAQ, Feet of Four, all them for the Warriors up at Phillips, all that. And then all of a sudden you kind of got around to the late 80s, mid 80s, late 80s, and then there was this dude named Pi. <laughs> <laughs> that was just big in life. Uh, you know, I guess most, most of the kid kind of man that was seven feet tall. And um, I remember that the first the first time. I had heard the name whatnot because my brother was a year ahead of me. He got the John Carroll at, um, let's see, he finished in 90. So he got the John Carroll in, in the fall of 86. Okay. And so I know all your folks and your partners was around about that time. Um, but I didn't get that to fall of 87. So I was like, it had to be a John Carroll. And I said, I don't know. Then I was thinking maybe it was somewhere around Thomas Means. Like um, it was, it was, but it may uh, still it have been at John, John Carroll. Carroll. That was it. John that was Carroll. it. Um, but, but yeah, man, but they're talking about in the neighborhood. So, um, like where are your folks from? Right? Oh man. So, so my folks come out of Evergreen Bottom. Okay. That's, that's where my, my great grandparents on both sides lived was in Evergreen Bottom. Well, let, let me say that my great grandparents on my mother's side was in Evergreen Bottom. Um, my, uh, my grandparents on my dad's side were Evergreen Bottom. And so they both went to church there. It was it was strange. Um, my mother's um, lineage, they were all at, at um, Sardis Baptist Church. They was deacon, deacon board and all that stuff there. Um, my dad was Evergreen Missionary. But at some point, my great grandparents, Ernest and Essie Nesby, they decided to send my grandmother, Geraldine McLean. They sent her to Our Lady of Fatima Catholic. And somehow she became Catholic. So everybody else was Baptist. The whole line of the family is Baptist. My grandmother became Catholic. Her brothers never did, but she did. Um, and so then my mom actually attended Our Lady of Fatima and Evergreen. So since they were in the neighborhood, by the time she finished up with Catholic services, when they came home, all the kids was at church having fun anyway. So she attended that as well. Um, so that's where they grew up. My mom and dad actually lived around a corner from each other as little kids. Um, so um, coming up there, we at one point when they first got married, um, they lived right over there by oh, what's the Fountain Heights. Okay. Stayed some apartments over by Fountain Heights. Um, my dad started out at Lawson with Larry Langford and Clint Simpson and all those guys. We're running partners together back in the day. Fred Plump, um, all of them were out at lot loss. And most, like my dad never went off to the military, but most of his friends did. And so okay. um, as they came through there, um, he did Lawson. Then he transferred over to UAB at one point. My mom, meanwhile, was finishing up at Birmingham Southern in 71, I would imagine. And um, they got married. She, I think she graduated one weekend. And they got married the next. Um, so, um, and I'll never forget my dad to tell the story about how one of his friends 
uh, from the neighborhood, this young lady, I think she thought she was going to be the one to marry him. And so he got he got a mark on his hand from where she dug her nails in him in the reception line. <laughs> oh, you see? <laughs> I thought my dad was exaggerating, but I met some of the ladies from the neighborhood because they, they still are all pretty close and whatnot. Yeah. And they was like, yeah, everybody wanted that. My, my dad grew up with about seven sisters. And so he was very keen and aware and sensitive about how ladies to be treated and all. So, and, and, and from my understanding, he was the dresser and the dancer back in the day. So, yeah, he, he, was, he was high commodity, supposedly. Man, if you can dress it, you can dance, you ain't going wrong. Yeah. I, like I said, I, I, at first I was like, Daddy, you just you telling some extra stories. Man, it ain't. <laughs> but but Mary Mo grew up in the neighborhood with him. And Mary Mo was like, no, they, they liked your daddy. <laughs> they, wow. Your daddy was something else. So, yeah. yeah so. What about, you said you had a brother. How many siblings? So I got two siblings. Um, I have an older brother who finished. He retired after 22 years from Birmingham Police Department. And now he's over at UAB. Um, it's funny. He, like I said, he was a year ahead of me at John Carroll. He, he jokes now that, you know, by the time he retired, because he had a college degree, um, <laughs> by the time he retired from Birmingham, the retirement money, plus what UAB's paying him as a, as a seasoned cop, he was like, yeah, all I did was work and make the money, and now I'm making about the same amount you're going to be making. I was like, yeah, not quite. But, <laughs> but, it, but it's dangerously close, you know. Uh, but, but, uh, but he put his life on the line going out there. Um, eating all those Twinkies and stuff out on 280. Um, <laughs> and then I got a baby sister who works up at Brookwood in healthcare. Um, so she she actually got a chance to finish the high school that my brother and I both wanted to attend. Like we right. wanted to go to Parker. Okay. All we wanted to do is we wanted to go to Parker. We wanted to play football at Parker. Nothing against John Carroll. I had a great time at John Carroll. Yeah. I, I, I don't know that I would have traded for the world. Um, but growing up in the college village, because that's where my dad eventually settled our family is over in College Hills. Yeah. Um, and so we were up the street from Legion Field. So, you know, our Saturdays grew up, Alabama coming in, playing football down the street, the folks parking cars all through the neighborhood. And as big as those games were on Saturdays, the games for Parker High School on a Friday night, whether it was them against West End or That's Phillips right. or whatever else, wasn't nothing better. Wasn't that, nothing man, better. it wasn't nothing better. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And I want you to tell me the appreciation you have for John Carroll, those relationships, that education, the whole nine yards at this age. Because a lot of times I think we take certain things for granted. Right. And we look back and have a different look. Or right. maybe it's the other way around. You know, you. You thought it was everything was sweet, but right. you know, it <laughs> exactly. It, it well, I'm a, I'm gonna tell you, it's a mixed bag. It, it's a mixed bag for me, and, and and this is why. Like sometimes folks will look at me and say, "Well, wait a minute, you went to John Carroll." I mean, there's a lot of folks that swear I went to Parker because even even as an attorney, judicial candidate, and last week even as the judge elect. Um, you find me on the sidelines whenever Parker has a home game holding the chains for the football team, uh, up close and personal. Um, we are very intentional about giving back and being involved with Birmingham City Schools. Um, so on the one hand, um, that's still a man, but what if? Because I've seen the bonds and the love that the alum have had for those institutions. If you go out to West End Day and the places like that and Rams and all that stuff, like with my wife, there is a tremendous pride that kids who went to those schools had. And, you know, of course, we thought that, you know, we were going to John Carroll, so it was different, and we got the better end of it. And, and in some respects, we did. And I don't regret anything about John Carroll. It was an awesome time. Um, um, I know it was. That's the <laughs> <laughs> it, it, was, it was. It was an awesome time. We, we, I'm not certain. I'm not sure if the spirit – I'm not sure if the spirit – is now what it was when I was there. Um, because one of doing this campaign, one of my big supporters uh, was an Italian girl that I went to school with there. Um, I never forget even getting into a debate online with some folks 
um, some years back, not this past election, but in the past. And we were debating some of the issues. And one of my friends who's, who's pretty white, right wing, um, one of her folks were online and we were going back and forth. And one of, one of the guys on her page was like, oh, he's just one of those ignorant liberals that don't, don't know this and don't know that, don't know his head from his whatever. And the girl said, nope, 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 nope. We're not going to do that. They said, um, I have my views. He and I differ from the views. But let me let you understand something. There's no better person that I've ever come across than Fred Bowling. And that's what she said in the midst of her folks. Like, we, we don't have to agree on anything, but understand this. He would do anything and love you just like anybody else if, if he came across you, you were in need. And so it was those type of relationships that John Carroll, that was special to me. I got a chance to see and understand how other folks think and how they feel about different things. Um, it didn't change my view on, about, on how I believe, um, but it gives me an appreciation how other folks are and, and an understanding about what really needs to happen in Birmingham, and that is for folks to come together as community and be neighbors. Um, so, you know, and, and, and while I was there, I, was, I guess I was pretty popular. I was student council president. That was, that was my uh, first election. <laughs> that was my first election. And, and, and honestly, um, up in the, at that's, that time, at that time you know it would only be your first? I actually, no. I actually thought it would. Truth be told, as a youngster at John Carroll, um, it, and even before then, I would tell some folks in the neighborhood, my dad's neighborhood um, up in Norwood, that's where his mother eventually moved when they moved from Evergreen Bottom. Due to a house fire, they moved up Norwood. And there was a guy uh, named Mr. Deke, and he worked over the mountain um, with some pretty wealthy families that I think it was a doctor who had come from the country, Winston County, somewhere, and came here and set him up. Was going to set him up in Mountain Brook, but he was like, no, I'd rather be in a neighborhood with other folks that look like me. Um, and so he moved into that Norwood neighborhood. And I can remember as an eight-year-old saying, and, and, I, and I'm, not, I'm not hinting at anything else, like my wife said, we done running for a while. Um, but as, as about a 10-year-old, I think I, I had expressed that, yeah, I'm going to be the mayor of the city. Um, wow. And it was an odd thing because Mr. Deke, when he heard me say that, he pulled me from the other boys. Because uh, in the neighborhood at the time, I had cousins, most of which were male. Um, and it was maybe about five or six of them and probably 10 other boys their age. And so he pulled me to the side and he was like, well, just understand something now. If that's what you're going to do and you're serious about that, you just need to make sure that you get a good appreciation of what the truth is in Birmingham because things ain't what they seem. He said, the folks over there, they got the money. The money controls things. He said, so you need to understand that. And you need to understand how to navigate those circles and in some ways be disarming to let them understand that you mean business and your folks are going to have to share an American dream, but you got to do it in a way such that you're not trying to take away their American dream. And so it was interesting to me because I was like at 10, I was like, man, I just said I wanted to be the mayor because I think around about that time, Richard Arrington had just got in. I was like, we're going to be just like Dick Arrington. I, um, you know, and, um, you know, God's funny in the way he does things because we end up in his, in his home that he built. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It is. It is. Yeah. But right now, I'm 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 quite satisfied to take on this job as as circuit court judge. Yeah, so, we, we <laughs> right. Now, let me let me set something else up. Uh huh. Um. Well, I don't know. Is it time to say that you are important? Not just because I know you, but everything you stand for doing things in the right order, pursuing higher education, um, and being honorable in work after school. But I want you to talk about the importance and the value of your education, of your higher education, college, mm -hmm. law school, and how it changed you from a 
young man, well, I'll say, yeah, from a young man to a, a at least wise young man. Okay. Um, first of all, education is, I think, is the cornerstone and the centerpiece for all of this. Um, I, and I got a lot of views on education. Um, a lot of my practice actually dealt with dealing with litigation and legal issues in and around education. I represented school boards. Um, I've represented some principals against school boards. Um, I've done a lot of work in that arena um, and actually has, have substitute taught um, at a youth detention facility. Um, so, you know, education is one of those things that was always pushed in my household. Um, my mother was a National Honor Society member. Uh, like I said, she was at Birmingham Southern when there probably were 10 of them on campus, all total. Um, I remember her telling me how they would have to have socials um, with the young men and whatnot from Parker and uh, other high schools because there just wasn't any representation up there on that campus. Um, and, and so early on, I remember I was always a kid who asked the next question. Um, my middle son is probably my clone when it comes to that. Um, he's a little bit more even keel, which I'm, I'm glad he is. Um, but always seeking and asking the next question to the point where, I ain't gonna lie, teachers used to be like, oh my God, would you please stop? But it was always wanting to know because I understood that part of our responsibility is to get to a point where we can lead and guide, where at some point, you know, I recognized early on that the folks that had the wisdom were eventually not going to be here. And so it was going to be left to us. Um, so when they talk about the education um, and, and, and education in all forms, now higher education was for me. That, that was my path. Um, I understood I was going to go to law school. Um, I was pretty good in science. And my dad, I think, actually was kind of hinting and, and wanting me to maybe do medicine. Um, but I knew law and, and trying to advance through that platform is where I needed to go. Um, so school was one, and, and I tell you, going leaving Our Lady Fatima, it was always a pride and joy for me from the time I got into kindergarten. You know, when other kids, when it was a poor card day, kids would be nervous. Oh man, it's like, what they say, a long tail cat in a room full of rocking chairs. <laughs> um, they would be nervous and, and they was always, but Fred ain't ever nervous, he don't care. It, it, it came natural. Um, I'm not going to say with regard to schoolwork that I always had the best work ethic um, at the time, but school came natural and God preserved me in a lot of that. Um, but it was always important for me to try to learn something more. Um, one of the lessons I got early on, though, about having to combine God's given abilities in the education realm with the hard work. Um, there was a lady named Miss Smith, Norma Jean Smith. Uh, in fact, she still stays right here in Titusville. Um, I actually saw her on the campaign trail. Uh, she still looks just the same as when she taught me in the seventh grade. I swear to God. Um, and, and, and the crazy thing is that she actually, as a young teacher, taught my mother. Um, and, and I think she, I think she really did find the found the youth because she, she's still driving. She's got to be getting close to 90. Um, but again, she looks just like she did when she was seventh grade. But I never forget, um, three quarters in a row, my seventh grade year, um, math came up, passed the test, but she had these homework folders and you had to show your work and do your homework. And for three quarters in a row, Fred didn't turn it in. But I aced the test. She sat me down and said, Mr. Bowling, I'm going to tell you, I don't care what you get on the test. If you don't turn my folder in, your grade is going to reflect that. Pfft, man, whatever. You know, seventh grade, I'm about to become the eighth grade. <laughs> you know, I ain't never had nothing but an A throughout the whole time. And... Just, you know, folks that don't believe it stinks. You know, I, I, I just went on about my business and said, nah, we good. I ain't got to take it. And I did not turn that homework folder in. And when I woke up the day that we were getting report cards, school had already let out. 
My brother was an eighth grader, so they were getting ready to have that graduation ceremony. They had several parties lined up. And we had spent the day with my grandmother. And we were out shopping and everything. And it was something told me. I said, you know, I had a couple of dollars in my pocket. I went and bought my parents a gift. Because something just didn't feel right about that day. I was like, I know I'm in trouble. I, I was like, I can feel it. I didn't turn that in. That lady going to do something. I didn't know how bad it was going to be, but she going to do something. My folks showed up to the house and congratulated my brother. We getting ready. It was a party that night. And when they came in the house, I was like, look what I bought y'all. They said, like, oh, that's nice. I could tell by the way my mama said, that's nice. And I hadn't seen my daddy's face yet, but my mom said, oh, that's nice. I was like, uh-oh. And my daddy came in, and he looked, and he was just looked at me and said, oh, you going to get it. And I was like, why is he being calm, though? Then it, thought on, it dawned on me. My great-grandmother would not let them bother me. <laughs> Yes, it made nice, but I was, and, and I heard I was the only grandchild that she could hold that didn't cry. So I don't care what I had done. They couldn't punish, they could, my dad had to come up with a whole new punishment because she would not allow them to whoop me in front of her. And so this carried over to where my daddy would just save my whoopings for when I got home. He said, oh, you going to get it. And I was like. What did I do here? Man, we went on that ride home. We went to Jack's. Jack's was up on the corner at Birmingham Southern. We went to Jack's, got a hamburger, got a shake. Got me my favorite stuff. So then I was thinking, I said, well, maybe they just pranking me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Something. Right. I finished, got home. My dad's I take my clothes off and go lay on that bed. I was like, are you at least going to tell me what it is I'm doing? He said, oh, we're going to tell you. He said, D for dummies. I said, D? Now, mind you, I done aced every test. <laughs> she put a D on that report. I don't even know if she actually put on the permanent card. But the one she sent home had a D. <laughs> I got towed up. And then I was like, well, I ain't going to no party. Oh, you going to the party? So you going, you in the party with man, singing, I'm at, but... I'm at, man, I'm at the party still going. <laughs> <laughs> As a 13 year old now, yeah. I, I'm 13 years old and I'm still doing this. And I was like, oh man, it's crazy. Um, but, but, but that let me understand that, that, you know, it's not just about your talents that you also got to put the work in. Um, and, and, and that, that education is something that you take, that don't take for granted. Because I used to always ask my dad questions about the PBS specials and stuff about how black folks were treated and everything else. And I'm looking at, well, this was in Birmingham. And I, I never forget an image that stuck in my head when they were showing the, the police and the brutality and all that stuff downtown, the folks protesting for rights. And I could never, it was an image. The dogs were the image that stuck with me. I literally watched an image where there was a young lady, and I, I, I wish I could go back and look and find that special and try to figure out who it is, because I'm sure she's still around somewhere um, or somebody that knows. But it was a young lady that had fallen to the ground and whatnot, and I saw an officer come over and kick her in the stomach. And I was like, I asked my dad, and it's like, that can't happen again. How do I? And, and his thing was, you have to maximize and be your best. You have to get as much education as you can so that you will be equipped to deal in any arena. Um, and so that was, that's sort of my lifelong motivation for that. And so as I went through um, John Carroll, I had, I realized that we had not been exposed. And as great as Fatima was, there were some things that we had not been exposed to um, that, that came at John Carroll. Um, and of course, being a football player, somewhat popular, you know, I was trying to balance all of that. And so I had to, to really dig in. Um, and I had some great teachers that John Car that just would not let me, it's like, no, you're gonna get it. You bright, you're gonna get it. Um, and, and when I see them, they, they, they come up and they congratulate me um, to this day. Um, and they always push me because they said, we saw that was something there. Um, so when I left John Carroll, I had performed pretty good. I had great ACT scores, um, but I took, 
pretty strenuous classes. I didn't take the base level classes there. Um, so I think I may have finished John Carroll with like a two nine. And I was like, that's not, that ain't me. Um, and so I was getting ready to make the choice about where I was going to go to school. Um, I'd always said I wanted to go to Morehouse. Got accepted and everything, but I already had a brother that was already in college. He was at Auburn. And um, my dad was working at U.S. Steel. And I made a decision that I wasn't going to put his pockets through Morehouse. Mm -hmm. um, and it was that combined with the fact that I said after having left John Carroll, I kind of had an urge to go to a PWI just to say, wait a minute. I, I'm not just this in, in my own setting. Um, and so the combination of, of trying to save him money um, and wanting to prove something, that led me to go to, I was choosing between Alabama and Auburn. And the crazy thing is that at the time I was an Alabama fan, a devout Alabama fan. But at Auburn, I was guaranteed an apartment with my brother instead of a dorm. <laughs> so that's how I ended up at Auburn. That's kind of a no brainer. Right, 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 right. <laughs> I had, I had my brother there. We had never been apart except for that one year he was at Auburn and I was still at John Carroll. Um, and it's funny, I even sneaked down on my prom night um, and, hung, and tried to catch up with him, but I couldn't find him. And so I ended up having to drive all the way back to Birmingham after not finding him. <laughs> uh, but um, um, got to Auburn, made pretty good money in the first couple of years. That was one of those years was the year that Alabama played Miami. Uh, um, in the in the Sugar Bowl, I believe, and Antonio Langham was it Langham that took the ball from the guy, chased him down, and took the ball from him, or T. Um, but um, you know, I realized then also that a lot of times folks do stuff with their off their emotions and not off of analytics and numbers. Uh, and I realized that emotions are fine to express. But you bet on your you bet on your brain and you bet on your analytics. Uh, so I made a pretty good little bit back in the day. Statue limitations <laughs> <laughs> off of off of Alabama. Um, and then the interesting thing is that um, we were always like the big brothers to a lot of the young girls and whatnot with John Carroll. And I remember one spring break, John Carroll had a couple of girls that were looking at going to Alabama, and so they was like, "Well." The mom's like, well, y'all take them down. We got to work. You mind driving them down there to do their college visit? Sure. So I'm down there and I'm talking, shooting the breeze with the guy. The guy was like, so now you doing all this talking. What kind of grades you got down at Auburn? And I told him and he was like, you want a scholarship? I'm like, well, man, what you talking about? He said, if you could duplicate that for one semester here, I'll get you a full ride. And so I came home, told my dad, dad, I'm going to Alabama now. Got to Alabama, and I have no idea how this happened, none. Because um, like I said, I was still riding with the tide. I was still rolling with the tide um, my first two years at Auburn. And it just so happened that when I got to Alabama and I roomed with Joel Pryor, I think you might know him. My kids. <laughs> <laughs> I was rooming with Joel Pryor, and I got down there, and the folks were good people. I mean, nothing, nothing against any of the folks at Alabama. But I got down there and realized that home for me had become the Plains. And so I came back and told, now mind you, I'm the kid that told my dad that I'm making this choice because I'm worried about your pockets. <laughs> but I come back and I told him, you know what? I think I'm going back to Auburn. Daddy said, what did you say? He said, that's okay. That's okay. Y'all start back in January. You can go on over there and work at Bruno's. So I worked at Bruno's off of 31. And I was telling those guys in there uh, for about two months, I did night stocking. So we would roll out the cans and we put the stuff on the shelves and do all of that. And, and that taught me a lesson that, that was something else that was, that, that was amazing to me. I understood that your family and folks loved and supported what you do. That was the first time I realized that when you have the ability and the blessing to be able to go out there and better yourself and reach higher heights, that there's a broader community that 
if you're not being a butthole to them, there's a broader community that's really pushing for you. At least it was as I was coming up. Because as I talked to those young, those men that were out there working, some of them were 40s and 50s and whatever else, and they were doing pretty decent with their job at, at, at the grocery store. But as I talked to them, the sense of pride they had in, hey, you're doing all this talking, don't get stuck here. Go on back, do what you say you're going to do and everything else. Take all that dreams, what you want to do, whatever it is you're trying to do, go do it. And I realized then that that what I've always been told is that, you know, with who much is given, much is required and expected. And so the expectation is that I was going to go and follow what God had blessed me to do. And in doing so, um, if I did it right and I gave back and I kept that connection, that our community ain't really divided. Our community wants to champion and wants to support and wants to get behind somebody who wants to do it the right way. And we don't, we need to not lose sight of that. Um, <clears throat> so this is a long convoluted way of getting around to it. Um, but I, I ended up doing everything I need to do to prove myself. Uh, finished with a three, five at Auburn. Um, my dad did not have to pay for law school cause it was taken care of. I had a full ride merit scholarship at Howard. Um, Finished Howard Cum Laude uh, with a with a three point six. Um, got graduated there in nineteen ninety nine. Um, became an attorney while I was still in school, so I actually had a special license in D.C. to practice uh, indigent defense while I was there. Um, and everything in life has really been a blessing. There's been some tough days, but I really can't say that. And, and, and I didn't grow up with a silver spoon. Let me make you understand this. Mom and dad, at, at, in the 80s, you had still laid off. But my dad's example was, I got a family that I'm responsible for taking care of. And so when you had still laid off, them same car magnets, I got them inside of my car saying, elect Fred Bowling. My daddy went to a shop and had some made. Bowling Construction. No job too big, no job too small. And my daddy picked up a hammer and a nail and began to do small repairs, um, home additions, home remodels, whatever it took to make sure our family was taken care of. Um, I, he went to work with some of the guys who were, at the time, some of the most noted um, home repair folks in the black community. And that was, that's when I learned another lesson, and that is, Getting over is not your aim. Your aim is to do the very best job you can. I never forget, and I, I leave that person nameless because I think they, they learned the lesson and got better, but I will never forget my dad was working with a guy, and the contractor later asked for cedar closets, and she went and paid the premium to get cedar line closet. That's what she wanted. and. The contractor had my dad, he was just an assistant. And my daddy said, well, hey, she wanted cedar. This, this some old knotty pine. The contractor said, she don't know the difference. We're going to get the cedar stain, put a little fragrance in it. We're going to paint it. We're going to put that in there. She don't know the difference. Well, I don't know how, but the lady did know the difference. And my daddy sat there and he watched that woman as, as after that job was done and everything else. He said, it looked great. But he could tell that lady was kind of bothered by it. And he went back by there and that lady was in tears. She's like, that ain't what I asked for. So my daddy took the money he had earned. Now here we go now. My mama working down at Bell South. U.S. Steel, I think he was drawing a little, so this, uh, not disability, but uh, uh, what you get when you ain't, uh, you ain't working? Unemployment, Unemployment check from U.S. Theater that laid him off. And he went and took that money he had earned off that job and went and got that woman where she's, he told her, he said, now you got to help with some of these supplies, but I'm gonna do the job for you. And when I tell you that woman then told her friends and told her other friends, and my dad's reputation got to the point where he was trusted to do all kind of work. Um, to the point where even the priest saw how he worked in the, in the church and saw how he still did what he did for us. And so when there was repairs and stuff need to be done at Our Lady Fatima, 
the priest came and was like, well, hey, we got somebody in the church that know how to do it. We're going to spend the money anyway. So if you went through Fatima, and when we came back that, um, that, that next school year, he and this guy named Mitchell Edwards, who also had worked at U.S. Steel in management, but his job had got laid off. He, my daddy, and the priest at the time, a guy named Father John Crotty, they formed the CBE, Crotty Bowling Edward Construction Group. Now, they, ain't, they weren't licensed. To, well, they got licensed, but they weren't an official company. But that's what they called themselves. When they got satin jackets and everything. And that summer, they replaced carpet, painted the entire inside of the school. They crafted and manufactured cabinets for the teachers to do their storage and whatnot. Mr. Edwards was real good at doing stuff like on a rotary saw. So one class had all different type of animals. The other ones had ABC. The other one had numbers. Every classroom, one through eight. And so I just saw the, the pride of craftsmanship and work and being able to do some of their own hands. And then my daddy looked around. It's like, well, child care expensive, you know, laid off. And he's looking around. He said, I know other parents got to be going through the same thing. So he started an after-school program at Fatal. So every little way he can get a couple of dollars. And Lord, as soon as he made the dollar, though, he was paying them out to folks. Because that same summer, my daddy put us to work to earn our money. So then my friends started talking about, well, Mr. Bowling, we want a job. Man, y'all don't know, y'all don't know how to even hold a hammer. <laughs> but the whole little basketball team at Fatima, it was six or seven of us coming in the summer because all the kids lived in the neighborhood. And my dad would have us doing little jobs to clean up around they, they construction stuff. They and eventually they even put a roof on at the church. I was like, y'all don't know nothing about no commercial roof, but they put the roof on at the church. Uh, we were cleaning up, we were picking up, and it was my, me and six of my friends. And you got to imagine in the summer, this is the greatest program ever. My daddy paying us, he feeding us. But then when we not doing work, we do work for maybe about two or three hours a day. But then we had a whole gym to ourselves. We had the whole field out there to play football. It was the best summer camp ever. <laughs> series of stories really paints a wonderful picture of you through looking at your parents and your where you come from but before I let you go I have to ask you to educate us on the role that your uh, court plays here at Jefferson County. Good deal, good deal. Um, so this came up um, on the campaign trail, and I, and I and I know I was like, Lord, when I got into them stories, I could see you looking. I was like, I got 13 more topics to get to, but I, I don't know, but something's living. Let me spin that that way. And so I, what, the reason I do what I do is because that's what all, I've always seen. But in looking at what the court does, um, Somebody asked that early on on the, on the trail, and I said the quick, easy way to explain it is that if you take away probate court, well, set probate court to the side. If you take away criminal, domestic relations, and family court, almost every other dispute that goes on between two individuals, between companies, between municipalities, between an individual and a company, um, between an individual and a municipality, almost every other matter will likely come through this court. Um, and the threshold amount is 20000 and above. Um, so matters that are less than 20000 could actually be filed in the district courts. Um, but the thing about the district courts is that if you're not happy with the decision in district court, within 14 days, those matters can be appealed up to the circuit court. Um, in the state of Alabama, you have district courts, state courts, you have state court system, you have district courts, circuit court. Then you have the Court of Appeals, criminal, Court of Appeals, civil, and then the Alabama Supreme Court. Um, so if you have a dispute that has to be resolved in court, chances are circuit, civil, circuit court is where it's going to be decided. Now, some folks say, well, y'all kind of specialize in Birmingham. And that's true because of the size of Jefferson County. 
and I said Birmingham, but Jefferson County, the size of Jefferson County and the number of judges we have, we're able to actually break out roles. There are some counties who only have a single judge um, or may have a district judge and a circuit judge, but those are the only ones they have. So of course that circuit judge will deal with divorces. They'll deal with um, child custody matters. They'll deal with criminal as well as civil. Um, here in Jefferson County, we're lucky to be able to kind of specialize to some extent. Um, so my court will be, I'm not gonna say exclusively because I, I do believe that the presiding judge has some discretion to shift some stuff if need be. Um, but I believe uh, we're gonna be 95 to 99%, I'll be doing strictly civil matters um, that are $20,000 and above. Um, and, that, and those are cases where people don't go to jail unless they decide to disrespect the court um, and they can be held in contempt. But in general, if folks say, well, I don't want to come in front of you because I don't want to go to jail. Well, is you're going to have to say something real ugly about my mama or something for you to go to jail in court, <laughs> in my court. Um, um, and I say it's set a probate aside, and that's because it does not necessarily exclude all probate matters. Because if an issue, so if an issue cannot be resolved or you're not satisfied with a determination in probate court, those, some of those matters can also be appealed up to the circuit court. Um, so your circuit court is your base trial level court um, for matters that are $20,000 and above. I know you are not going to let this um, opportunity to shout your wife and your children out and whomever else you Absolutely, can absolutely. Um, man, I tell you, and, and <laughs> so it's going to be, I'm, I'm trying to, uh, um, my investiture is going to be on the 9th of, of January. And it's tough because I'm going to tell you, October of this year, October 4th, was the one year anniversary of having lost my mom. Um, so, you know, she won't share in that dream with me. Um, well, she will, but but not physically here. Um, so, you know, I, I'm, I'm, but I'm so grateful for the, what she did um, in, in rearing me. Um, and it's going to be bittersweet. Um, but I am happy to know that, that my dad will be there. Um, and in fact, he's he's waiting, John Bolin. He's already told me, he said, now, wait a minute. You told me that we weren't going to Vegas until you won. So you done won now. So when we head it out. So so soon we'll be going to Vegas. <laughs> um, but but absolutely shout out my wife, um, Dr. Brandy Bolin, which I think she's already been on the podcast once. Um, and, and most folks know, uh, in fact, folks joke, not when they, they weren't joking, they, they were joking when they told it to me, but I think they were quite serious. And, and I understand why, um, it was funny when we went over to the Hoover Dems, they said, well, we're impressed with you, Mr. Bowling, but the fact that your wife came over here and spoke on your behalf, just understand something. You can win any race you get into unless you get into it against your wife. <laughs> they said there would be no way that we're voting for you if we have to go up against your wife. Um, but she is the most wonderful, devoted, patient, loving person ever. Um, now, nah, it's a lot of stuff I've, I've had in life that I don't deserve. I definitely don't deserve her. I ain't giving her, I ain't giving her up, uh, but, but I don't deserve her. Um, she's given me three wonderful kids. I have my oldest, uh, which is Frederick John Rodney Bowling. Uh, my middle boy is Franklin Joseph Rudolph Bowling, and my little Tara, uh, or otherwise Angel, is Faith Janice Rochelle Bowling. So the star of the fam. The of the fam. <laughs> um, and of course, in the house now, we actually have my 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 mother in law. Who, man, when you talk, it's funny how my mother in law. You talking about a campaign person? She goes out there unabashedly and tell folks. Now she came here saying she was coming to rehab a, a knee. Now she rehabbed the knee once before and it only took about six months. She's now been here two years talking about rehabbing the knee. Ain't nothing wrong with her knee no more. <laughs> but 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 she is she is here, she's part of this household and and she don't want to go and we don't want her to go. Um and but I tell you, you can't have a bigger champion. Um there ain't but two people on this earth that she would put ahead of me, and that's her son, Gerald, and her, and my wife. But after those two, she'd fight anything going except for God over me. So um, um, that's 
that's that. I got to say my brother, Chris Bowling, shout out to him. My sister, Angela, um, my nephew up in Chicago, who's who decided he's going to follow somewhat in his uncle's footsteps. He's finishing up law school this December. Um, my niece, Mi Michaela, who's down at, uh, who's at Ramsey on the Chili Squad freshman year. Um, my niece, Kristen and Ashley, my brother's kids. Um, Kristen is getting ready to finish up her REN degree um, at Alabama, no, Auburn Montgomery. Um, and then extended family, Jill, Jolly. She finished Yale last year and she's getting ready to go to law school, but she's doing an internship up in DC. And then Lauren in Alabama and London, who's a freshman at, at Ramsey. I think that's, I think I got them all now. I ain't gonna claim the dog. My, my nephew, he said his dog is part of the family, but that's, that's part of his family. <laughs> that's it.